The next lecture is going to be about language models. Uh, this lecture is split into three parts. Part one. So what is a language model? Uh, specifically, a probabilistic language model is a technique that takes a sentence as input and assigns a probability to it. So the probability of the sentence is the same as the probability of the joint uh, sequence of events, word one, word two, and so on, all the way to word n, which is the last word in the sentence. So this style of technique for natural language processing is very different from the deterministic methods that we looked at before using things like context-free grammars. The idea is that we want to take all the possible sentences in a given language and assign them such probabilities so that they all add up to one. Now this is obviously a very difficult task because it's possible that uh, you can write or say a sentence that was never pronounced before. So how do you come up with a probability for it? So the problem of language modeling is also related to the problem of predicting the next word in a sequence. So for example, if I start the sentence by saying, let's meet in times, and then dot, 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 can you predict the next word? Well, there are probably several different things that can be next, but a very likely one would be the word square. Let's meet in times square. So for example, uh, here, the idea is that uh, even though the probability of square in general is relatively low, in the context of let's meet in times, uh, that probability increases significantly. So the posterior probability is much higher than the prior probability. Another example, General Electric has lost some market blank. Well, what's the next word? Well, is it going to be square? No, it's not going to be square. And most likely it's going to be something like share. So General Electric has lost some market share. And again, the idea here is that in the context of losing market something, uh, it's very likely that the next word is share. So what is the formula for predicting the next word? Well, it's a conditional probability of predicting the probability of uh, word n given all the words before. So what word follows the word your? So according to the Ngram website from Peter Norvik, here's the list of some of the words that follow your in a huge uh, corpus of Google documents. So the word Abilities follows your in 160,000 cases. The word ability follows your with a count of 1.1 million and so on. As you can see, all of those numbers are pretty large and they can also be very different from one another. So what is a language model again? It's something that is used a lot in speech recognition. For example, we want to be able to have the probability of the sentence recognize speech to be significantly larger than the probability of rec a nice beach. We can also use it in text generation. So for example, we want to generate a sentence that has the phrase three houses with a higher probability than the sentence that contains uh, the phrase three house. Spelling correction, we want the probability of my cat eats fish to come out of the spelling correction system than my xat eats fish, just because xat is not a word in English, even it could be a typo. Machine translation, we want the probability of the blue house, given, let's say, a French expression, to be larger than the probability of the house blue. And then many other uses. For example, in optical character recognition, we want the text that is extracted from the image uh, to be grammatical. And also in summarization, we want the summary that is produced automatically to be uh, grammatical. And also, language models are also used in document classification. In that case, you can have a probability of the, this particular sentence coming from English and, or from French, and then if you got which of those two language models gives it a higher probability, and therefore you can classify it by language. Or you can have a language model that corresponds to sports news articles and another one that corresponds to business articles and figure out whether the document is sports or business based on the probability that it was generated from either one of those two models. So very often the language model is coupled with something called the translation model. Uh, in a few minutes we're going to talk about translation models, but let's focus now on uh, language models. So let's go back to the idea of computing the probability of a sentence. Well, how do we do this? Uh, well, one possibility is to just uh, find all the times that this particular sentence has been used in a large corpus and then uh, use that. However, most sentences that we see in a corpus are going to be novel, they're not seen before, so their probability estimate is going to be equal to zero. And this is certainly not a good idea. We can never have enough training sentences to cover all the possible sentences in English. So how do we deal with probabilities for novel sentences? 
So let's see how to do this. What we're really looking for is to estimate the probability of the sentence as the probability of the joint distribution of the words in that sequence, W1 to Wn. Now we can rewrite this formula using the chain row, uh, and we're going to get that the probability of the sentence S is equal to the probability of the first word times the probability of the second word given the first word, and so on, all the way to the end where we have the probability of the last word given all the probabilities before. I should say that this is um, a correct formula. It means that it exactly gives the same result as the previous formula. The chain rule does not lose information. Okay, let's look at an example. Suppose that the sentence that we want to figure out is, I would like the pepperoni and spinach pizza. What's the probability of the sentence? Well, it's very straightforward. It's going to be equal to the probability of the word I, followed by the probability of would, given that the previous word is I, times the probability of like, given that the previous two words are I would, and so on, and times pizza, times the probability of pizza given all of the previous words. Okay, now let's look at something called an n-gram model. So an n-gram model allows us to sacrifice some um, uh, of the accuracy of the prediction, but in, on the other hand, get uh, very good uh, performance and deal properly with sparse training data. So we're trying to predict the probability of a word based on the words before. So for example, what's the probability that after the words let's meet in times, the next word is going to be square. Now we're going to use the so-called Markov assumption that tells us that the probability of a word is not dependent on the entire history, but just on the most recent one or two words. So if we look at the previous word alone and the current word, we're going to have a bigram model. If we look at the two previous words plus the current word, we're going to have what is known as a trigram model. So the, M, the word n-gram covers unigrams. That is no context. What is the probability of the word square regardless of the words before? A bigram example is when we want to compute the probability of square given that the previous word is times and Trigram example is probability of square given the words in times appearing in that order. So even in the trigram model, we are not going to look at any words beyond in. So anything to the left of in is going to be irrelevant. So let's look at some random text that is generated from the so-called Brown corpus, which is one of the oldest and most important corpora in natural language processing using n-grams of different lengths. So a two-gram random text looks like this. Again, this is not text that was uh, actually in the bound corpus. Instead, this is text that is generated automatically using a bigram model trained on the bound corpus. So here's how it works. We pick the first word at random, in this case, the word the. Then we look at a word that appears with a high probability after the word the, that's 53 years old. Then after that, we pick the next word she, based on the probability of she appearing after 53 years old. And so, on. so every word here is generated based on the previous word alone. We can do something similar with trigrams. For example, this text here. In this case, the word county, for example, is computed based on its probability to follow the words the and Fulton. The word jail is computed based on the probability that it appears after Fulton and county. We can do the same thing for four grams and so on. And in each case, the text is going to look more natural because at least we're going to guarantee that at least every consecutive sequence of four words is going to be something that has actually appeared in the previous text. So it's possible to go to trigrams, foregrams, and even five grams. However, it's very often the case that the larger n-grams, including trigrams, can be very sparse uh, to estimate from training data. So let's look at uh, some examples of uh, a specific corpus. So if we download uh, from Project Gutenberg the entire set of uh, works by uh, William Shakespeare, we can look at all the unigrams. There is about 900,000 words in uh, all of Shakespeare. So the, to use the linguistic terminology, that means that we have 900,000 tokens that correspond to about 30,000 types, uh, which is again a linguistic term that corresponds to the different types of words. So we have an average of 30 occurrences or tokens per type. And just a little uh, sidebar here, you can see that the entire set of works by Shakespeare is less than 1 million words. Now this is many orders of magnitude smaller than what we have nowadays on the web. So let's see how many bigrams we have in Shakespeare. So again, 
There's about 900,000 biograms in Shakespeare. There's just one fewer biogram than unigram uh, token uh, by construction. And it turns out that those correspond to about 340,000 different types. So each type is now only present about three times in the data set. And many other types are not present at all. So you can imagine if we have a vocabulary of about 30,000 words, so 30,000 squared, that's about 900 million possible biograms. Of those 900 million, only about 340,000 appear in the data set. So this is three orders of magnitude less than even one occurrence per type. So the data is extremely sparse, and this is going to be a serious problem if we want to estimate uh, probabilities of words based on large corpora. No matter how large they are, even biograms are not going to be represented frequently enough. Now let's see how we can actually estimate the probabilities of certain uh, words in a large corpus. Can we compute those conditional probabilities directly? For example, what's the probability that a certain word is going to follow a certain other word? Well, we really cannot. As I said earlier, the data is very sparse. We're going to instead use the so-called Markov assumption. So let's look at the sentence. I would like two tickets for the musical. We're going to use the following approximation. Instead of computing the probability of musical given the entire string that consists of seven words, I would like two tickets for the, we're going to approximate it with the bigram, the probability of musical given the word the, or just given the previous word. Uh, it turns out that for practical purposes, this is going to degrade the performance, but not that much. It, it's going to be a good trade-off, uh, given that we are going to have a much more flexible and uh, robust system than one that looks at the entire previous history. So the trigram uh, counterpart to this example is that the probability of musical, given I would like two tickets for the, is going to be approximately equal to the probability of musical, given the two previous words for the. So again, this is called a trigram model, and the previous example was a bigram model. So now let's see how we can estimate those probabilities from the training data. Suppose that we have a really large corpus, and we want to figure out what's the probability that we have the word square, given that the previous word is times. So we're going to see how many times a certain context appears in the training data, and how many times the certain conditional probability is going to appear. So here's a unigram example. The word pizza appears about 700 times in a corpus of 10 million words. So the maximum likelihood estimate for the probability of pizza, and here we actually use the term p prime or p hat in some cases, that is the estimate, the maximum likelihood estimate of the probability of pizza. In this case, it's going to be equal to the number of times that the word appears, which is 700, out of a total of 10 million possible times that it could occur. So the ratio here is 0 0.00007, which is a very, very small number, but it's still not zero. Let's look at the bigram example here. The word with appears a thousand times in the corpus, and the phrase with spinach appears six times. So we want to compute the probability of spinach given with. This is out of 1,000 possible contexts in which uh, the word with appears, only six have the word spinach after that. So the maximum likelihood estimate for the probability of spinach given with is 0 0.006. So one important thing to, to keep in mind is that if we learn those probabilities from one corpus, they're only going to be valid in corpora that are of a similar genre. So for example, if we learn uh, probabilities from a corpus of English language news, we can only expect those probabilities to be accurate to some extent uh, on other corpora of English news. We cannot expect them to work in other languages or even in other genres, for example, such as fiction or financial reports or email. So it's very important when you estimate those probabilities to use a corpus that is as comparable as possible as the one to the one that you're going to use for testing. So here's an example. We want to compute the probability of the sentence, I will see you on Monday. So one thing that you notice here is that I've enclosed the sentence in uh, XML type tags. Uh, where uh, the S symbol means start of sentence and the slash S symbol means end of sentence. It turns out that this is very important to do in uh, statistical language processing because we want 
to treat the beginning and end of sentences just as any other symbol in the sentence because the words that come right before or right after the beginning and end of sentences are going to be conditioned on those special symbols. So in this case, the bigram approximation of I will see you on Monday is going to be the probability of the word I given the beginning of sentence times the probability of will given the previous word is I times the probability of C given that the previous word is will and so on. The last thing here is going to be the probability of end of sentence given that the previous word is Monday. So here's an example from the set of all the books written by Jane Austen. So we have to compute the probability of the sentence Elizabeth looked at Darcy. So let's see how we can use this uh, inf the information from the corpus to compute this probability. We're going to use again maximum likelihood estimates for the n-gram probabilities. So the unigram uh, maximum likelihood estimate is just the probability of a certain word w sub i is going to be equal to the number of times count, the count of the word i divided by v, where v is the uh, size of the vocabulary or the set of all possible types of words appearing in the corpus. The bigram probabilities, again, are going to be in the following form. The probability of wi given wi minus 1 is going to be the count of wi minus 1 and wi appearing together divided by the count of wi minus 1. So let's look at some specific values. The probability of Elizabeth is 700, I'm sorry, 474 out of 617,091. Uh, converted into decimal numbers, that corresponds to about 7.6 times 10 to the minus fourth power. The probability of looked, given Elizabeth, is 5 out of 474, it's about 1%, and so on. We can compute all the other bigram probabilities using the maximum likelihood estimates. I omitted the beginning and end of sentence probabilities here, uh, just for simplicity, but in general they should be included in the computation. So now let's look at the bigram probability of the sentence. So the probability of Elizabeth look at Darcy as a bigram probability is going to be this number here, which is extremely low, 1.3 times 10 to the minus 9th power by computing the product of all the numbers so far. And we can also compare this with the unigram probability, which is just the probability of each of the different unigrams. So probability of Elizabeth times probability of looked times the probability of the word at, times the probability of Darcy. And you can see that here we have 1.3 times 10 to the minus 12th power. You can see that there is a difference of about 1,000, a factor of 1,000 between the two probabilities. In other words, the bigram probability of the sentence gives a much higher value uh, than the unigram probability. And this makes sense because the bigram model uses additional context information that the unigram model doesn't include. Now let's try to estimate the probability of the sentence looked Darcy Elizabeth at. Can you think uh, what the answer of this uh, question is going to be? So I'll give you a second to think about it. Well, uh, let me now give you the answer. The question was, uh, what's the probability that uh, of the sentence looked Darcy Elizabeth at? Well, it turns out that the unigram probability for this sentence is going to be exactly the same as the one on the line above because the unigram probability model doesn't take into account word order. There's going to be some reordering of the four numbers, but the product of them is going to be exactly the same. However, the bigram probability is going to be something several orders of magnitude smaller because looked Darcy, Darcy Elizabeth and Elizabeth at are very unlikely to have appeared in the training data. So it's very possible that this probability is going to be actually zero. So let me stop with this example and I'm going to continue uh, in the next set of slides in just a minute.